The paradox of time dilation is this. I imagine that I'm moving through this room and carrying a clock at high speed, of course. By the way, I tell the stories as though, uh, you know, it's a train or somebody running or something. Of course, if the, if the velocities involved are small, like everyday type velocity, you're never going to see any of the effects of relativity. I'm telling the story that way, but you've got to imagine that the actual velocities are way up there close to the speed of light before it makes a particle a difference. Anyhow, so I'm moving through the lab, and you look at me and say, hey, buddy, your clock is running slow. I look at you, and of course, because from my point of view, it's you who are moving in the other direction. I say, no, on the contrary, your clock is running slow. So, so, I say, your clock runs slow. You say, my clock runs slow. Question, who's right? Answer, we both are. <coughs> How can that be? Surely, if your clock is running slow, you should have concluded that my clock was running fast, not that my clock was also running slow. How can that be? How is this consistent? Well, once again, like in the, in the paradox of Lorenz contraction, you have to study very closely what it means to say that somebody's clock is running slow. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to watch you very carefully as you measure the rate of my clock and come to this absurd conclusion that my clock is running slow. Okay? So here I am. I, this clock is not plugged in, obviously, so I'm not, not thinking. But, but here I am. I'm running through the lab at high speed. And you people say, hey, your clock's running slow. Okay, I watch you very carefully. How did you come to that absurd conclusion? Well, what you did was, first of all, here was my clock and your clock, let's say, as I just came in the door with this thing. And let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, make things easy, that both of us, just as I passed by and we were right next to each other, you set your clock at 12 noon and I set my moving clock at 12 noon. So they both read 12 noon just as I passed you by. But now my clock is moving through at high speed and you're just sitting here. So, we set them both at t equals zero, if you like, or 12 noon, when mine passed by. Now, I carry the clock across the room. And when I get to the far end, you record what my clock says. My clock now says 15 after, right? Right, 15 after. <laughs> So when I get to the far end of the room, my clock says 15 after, that's the moving clock. Moving clocks run slow, so your clock here, your clock reads 25 after. And there, and then you compare the number 25 after with his, or compare the two clocks and just say, well, your clock is running slow. But notice what, I, what happened here. You compare one of my clocks, the moving one, with two different clocks of yours, right? He compared it with the one down there. You compared it with your clock that's sitting over here. Two completely different clocks. There are different ways of telling the story, but when I get down here, we can send some message down to him and have him compare it on his clock. But the simplest way of doing it is, we compared my moving clock with two different stationary clocks. So when I watch you doing that, I say, hey, wait a minute, this is not a symmetrical situation. You compared one of my clocks with two different clocks of yours. What do you say? It doesn't matter because, of course, we carefully synchronized our clocks. You and he did. Synchronized your clocks long ago, so you know that they're all ticking exactly the same. But there's the rub, because what did it mean to synchronize the clocks? When you guys synchronized your clocks, that means 
we sound on 12 noon at the same time. By the way, that was a different operation from this one. When we set our clocks both to 12 noon, they were right there in the same place. There can't be any ambiguity about uh, time ordering then. They were both, sorry, it wasn't your clock, it was your clock. <laughs> when we set them both to 12 noon, we were right here at the same location. So there's no, uh, no argument about simultaneity there. But when you synchronize your clocks with hers, which maybe you did two days ago, I don't care. Uh, I mean, you got all the time in the world to, to arrange that. They were synchronous as far as you're concerned. You set them both to 12 noon simultaneously. That's what synchronizing the clocks mean. But of course, if I went back and watched you do that, I would say no, on the contrary. You set hers to 12 noon, and then you waited a little while and said, here's to 12 noon. And that's how it happened, or was it the other way around? Whichever way it has to be. That's how it happened that even though both of your clocks were running slow from my point of view, you managed to come to this absurd conclusion that my clock was running slow. It's because not only were your clocks running slow, but they weren't even synchronized in the first place. And then you went ahead and compared my one clock with two different clocks of yours that didn't agree in the first place from my perspective. So that's why uh, you managed to come up with a ludicrous conclusion that my clock was running slow, when in point of fact, both of your clocks were running slow. The point is that your, t your clocks were not synchronized in the first place. From my point of view, of course, you tell the same story for me. When I move, measure one of your clocks and say it was running slow, I use two different clocks of mine. So I come in here, compare, compare my clock with yours, and then I move on, and my agent, who comes in the door a little while later, compares his clock with yours, but of course, I say my, our two clocks were synchronized. You see, both of us did exactly the right thing within our own reference frame. But each of us thinks that the other made the simplest error in the book in making the measurement. In this case, your clocks weren't even synchronized in the first place. But you say, they were synchronized within your reference frame, you're right. I say, however, I say they weren't synchronized in the first place. Can those two be compatible? Yes, those two statements are compatible. They're enforced actually by the relativity of simultaneity. Those are distant clocks. If we set our clocks to 12 noon when mine is right next to yours, then the question of simultaneity doesn't come into the picture. But when you compare, set your clock to agree with hers, her distant clock, then two different observers are going to say, one, one's going to say, we synchronized the property properly, the other one's going to say, no, you didn't. You set one to 12 noon, and then you waited a while before setting the other. <coughs> so the situation is simply asymmetrical. Remember this little parable when you're, when you're worrying about time dilation. Time dilations can sometimes be tricky. It's easy enough to say moving clocks run slow, but it's sometimes not clear which is the moving clock. Well, this is the test. The moving clock is the one clock, the, the single clock that was involved here. The non-moving clock, the stationary clocks, there's only two of them, or maybe more than two of them involved in the problem. So that's how you know which one is the moving clock when you're telling the story. Of course, if you're telling the story from this point of view, it was the only one of the left or clock you do. <clears throat> well, there's the paradox of time dilation. And it's possible to dress that up in, in more colorful language if you want. You'll see lots of paradoxes that basically result down to that issue. Yeah. From your perspective, when you were right there, is the distant clock faster? Like they said it after? Is that one slower than you? Or well, let's see. I think the way that I'm going to figure this out is that I know when all is said and done that even though your clocks were running slow, you've got to come out concluding that my clock was running slow. So I conclude. From my perspective, he set his to 12 noon, and at the same time, she set hers to, uh, let's see, earlier than noon, 10 to, half, uh, 15 to noon. So she already had 15 minutes uh, head start 
on this. So when I got down here, even though her clock was actually running slow, she still had a climb. Yeah. So uh, hers, hers would have to have been set earlier. So as we look, as I look down the line, I see you at, at one instant of time. Yours says, according to me, yours says 12 noon. Yours says 5 to noon. Yours says 10 to noon. Yours says 15 to noon. Her says 20 to noon. Something like that. And, get, and of course, in the other direction, they're getting uh, later and later. Okay. Every pocket okay. rest always have to have two, three, or four. So I get two, two at rest, and the one moving is by itself. Yeah. Why is it asymmetrical? Why do you have to compare two? With, if you're measuring the rate of a moving clock, you're going to be comparing one clock, the moving one, with two different stationary clocks. How, why is that necessarily true? Because my clock is moving. By the time I get over to here, if they want to compare it, they've got to compare it with a different clock up there. Or else make some, something that's the equivalent. That, as I was suggesting, there are different ways of telling this story, like that they send a light beam down to him and bounce it off something or other. In, in the books, you'll find all kinds of complicated ways of saying this, telling the same story. But essentially, the point is that when you're measuring the, the rate of a moving clock, you have to compare it with two different clocks of your own. How you set that up is uh, compared from one telling of a story to another. But basically, the stationary, for the stationary clocks, you've got to use two different ones. Why? Because I moved down here. I'm not next to him anymore. He doesn't know what my clock is reading. I mean, we're, uh, we're thinking that maybe this is 10 light years that I've traveled or something like that. So he, he can't even see my clock at that point. He has to compare, be compared with somebody who's right there on the scene. OK. Now I'm ready to start uh, relativistic mechanics. What we've been talking about so far is, if you like, the geometry of special relativity. Now, how do we talk about particle motion, forces, energy, momentum? So, suppose that I've got a particle here, and it's moving at high speed through the laboratory. T, red on the wall clock. 
you know French? You know what croc means in French? It means own, O-W-N. So it's the particle's own time. And I think that that's what happened here. <laughs> the proper is somebody rather didn't know what French meant and just translated over. I don't know how it came out in French in the first. Actually, that made that, that whole story made it completely nonsense. But that's how I remember <laughs> the word proper. What is it? It's own, really. O W N. The pro the particle's own time. Tau on particle's watch. Because of time dilation, the particle's watch runs slow relative to the wall clock. How slow? By a factor of gamma. And I can therefore say d tau for some, some interval, the time ticked off on the particle's watch is going to be less than the time ticked out, ticked off on the wall clock. How much less? A factor of gamma. Should I put in on the right hand side gamma or 1 over gamma? You tell me. One over gamma. Why? Because this is going to be a large number, 25 minutes. This is going to be a small number, 15 minutes. So I better divide by the gamma to make that come out right. It, that's the easiest error in the book to make. So I simply have to think it out each time. The moving clock runs slow. So this is a large number. I must divide it by something bigger than 1. Gamma, remember, is 1 of the square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared. So that's the connection between proper time and ordinary time. The watch particles watch time and the part and the uh, time on the clock. By the way, I write this in terms of differentials here, not in terms of the total time on the particles watch and the total time, the actual time on the wall clock. Do you see why? Supposing this particle is speeding up or slowing down or something like that, then the factor gamma would change from moment to moment. So the accumulated time on the particle's watch actually might be some complicated thing that I would have to get by integrating over this. But in every, every tiny interval, when it's going essentially at a fixed speed v, then I know that the ratio between the, the intervals of proper time and the interval of ordinary time is a factor of 1 over gamma. Which time is the right one, the correct one, the best one, the, the proper one to use? Well, Answer? Well, I don't know. For some purposes, proper time is more useful, and for some purposes, ordinary time is more useful. Of course, in classical physics, there isn't any difference, because the gamma is so close to 1 that v is much less than c. The gamma is so close to 1 that it doesn't matter. So classical physics is never going to give you a clue which one should you be using. But in relativity, we've got to recognize that there are two different times that one encounters when you're talking about the motion of a particle. Of course, if you had 16 particles moving around every which way, then each one of them has a different proper time. That's a little bit awkward. But if you're just dealing with one particle, it's not clear which one is the most useful time to keep track of. So, that was proper time. I was supposed to get this idea on the time. Item two, proper velocity. What is velocity? Well, velocity 
travel divided by the ordinary time, the wall time, that's probably what you would mean if you were watching some car drive down the road. You say, well, how far did it go? 500 feet. How long did it take to do it? On my watch, as I stand there watching, watching the thing go by, I think the natural thing would be to speak of the velocity distance traveled divided by my stationary time as I stand there on the, on the corner watching it. So, ordinary velocity. This is what we've always meant, by the way, about actually thinking about it too carefully. The V in the formula for gamma was ordinary time. Divided by time, 
measured on the ground. That's ordinary velocity. There's distance measured along the ground divided by proper time measured in the car. That's proper velocity. How about if I say, how about I go for distance measured in the car divided by ordinary time or proper time? Well, I guess that's not an interesting velocity because in the car's own reference frame, it never moved anywhere at all. So the dx would be, in that case, would be zero. So logically, you could say there, there are two different reference frames in here. Both the numerator and the denominator could be referred to either one of, or the other of the frames. So there are logically four different possibilities there. But these are the only interesting possibilities because if you measure the distance traveled in the moving reference frame, it's zero. Yeah? Are those t or tau? Which one? This is a tau, and this is a t. So in my my handwriting, if there's a if there's a line going above the horizontal, then it's a t. If it stops there, and moreover, if if the crossbar sags a bit, then it's a tau. So proper velocity, ordinary velocity, related to each other by a factor of gamma. Sometimes one is useful, sometimes the other. Item three, momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity and relativity as it was in classical physics. But the obvious question, obviously I set this up to make you ask this question, which velocity am I supposed to use? Should I define momentum as mass times ordinary velocity, or should I define momentum as mass times proper velocity. It's a question of definition, so you can't say one of them is intrinsically right and the other is intrinsically wrong. But in this case, it turns out that if you defined it this way, it would be a useless quantity. Mass times proper velocity gives us a useful quantity, and that's how we define momentum in relativity, as mass times proper velocity. I'm going to tell you in a second why that's the correct, the, the useful definition of momentum, and this is a lousy definition of momentum in relativity. And therefore, when you speak of relativistic momentum, we don't say, well, there's ordinary relativistic momentum and there's proper relativistic momentum. You say relativistic momentum, you mean mass times proper velocity, not mass times ordinary velocity. Why is that? Let me write down the formula here, actually. Mass times proper velocity, which is to say mass times gamma times ordinary velocity, because, or if I wrote out what the gamma is, it's mass times ordinary velocity divided by 1 minus ordinary velocity squared over c squared. So there's the formula for relativistic momentum. Now, I'm going to tell you why this is a lousy uh, way to define momentum. The argument is kind of subtle, and I don't want to distract attention from the essential result. The essential idea is that momentum is mass times proper velocity. So let's make this an aside here, just a commentary on why mass times ordinary velocity would be a lousy definition. 
example of a law of physics and we checked out to see that it worked the same way in both. system, then it's automatically conserved also in the second system. 
but I recover the conservation of momentum by you, under, uh, while using Einstein's velocity addition law by changing, if you will, the definition of momentum, or rather, using the definition of momentum as mass times proper velocity instead of, as I had implicitly done before, mass times ordinary velocity. Got a picture? That's a subtle argument, as I say, but I just wanted to mention that that's why Einstein chose to define momentum as mass times proper velocity instead of as mass times ordinary velocity, because he knew if he did it with mass times ordinary velocity, conservation of momentum would be out the window as a law of physics. Of course, this doesn't prove that momentum is conserved in relativity. What it proves is this, that mv, if you define momentum as mass times ordinary velocity, it couldn't be conserved in relativity. If you define it as m times u, mass times proper velocity, then at least it's possible that it's conserved in relativity. And you ask your experimentalist friends to go to the laboratory and find out whether in fact it is. So conservation of momentum defined this way is at least a possible law of physics, whereas mv is not a possible law of physics in special relativity. Anyhow, that's a lot of song and dance about why Einstein defines momentum not as mass times ordinary velocity, but as mass times proper velocity. And if you want to write it all in terms of the ordinary velocity, that means you must say mv over square root 1 minus v squared over c squared. Einstein himself, by the way, had a nasty habit I did, uh, his, for some historical reason, I don't know. He liked to combine the gamma, not with the v to make u, but rather with the m to make something that he called relativistic mass. This is not done anymore in modern physics, but I just got to mention this because you might encounter it somewhere. Einstein liked to write m relativistic, he called it relativistic mass, equals gamma times m. That is to say, the actual mass divided by the square root 1 minus v squared over c squared. This has the bizarre consequence that the relativistic mass gets bigger and bigger the faster the thing is going because the gamma factor gets larger and larger. Have you encountered this terminology? Most of the places that you will see it nowadays, the notion of relativistic mass is in high school physics text. Physicists don't use the notion of relativistic mass anymore because it doesn't buy you anything. It's simply an extra definition that gets you nowhere. It allows you to write, if you like, T, momentum is relativistic, relativistic mass times ordinary velocity. So if you insist on writing momentum as some kind of mass times ordinary velocity, then you're going to have to introduce this relativistic mass. But it doesn't do anything for you. It simply is an extraneous definition of a quantity that doesn't get you anywhere. So nowadays, most people, uh, most practicing physicists, don't use this term at all. relativity 
In relativity, it's not true that f is equal to ma, but it is still true that f is equal to dt by dt, provided, of course, that you use the relativistic formula for momentum. Whoops. 
right hand side is the integral of f dt. The f comes out in so uh, front is going to be f dt <coughs> plus a constant of integration. And on the left side, it is getting v over root 1 over c squared over c squared. That's a little bit more formal way of looking at it. But the point is, f v over root 1 minus v squared over c squared is f t plus k. Now, let's suppose that it started from rest. at t equals 0. If it starts from rest at t equals 0, what's k? It's 0, isn't that right? Because I'm saying v equals 0 when t is equal to 0. So this is 0, this is 0. k must also be 0. In that case, if it starts from rest, k is equal to 0. If it started with already some initial velocity, and then you'd have to fix that up. So, what do we have? mv over root 1 minus v squared over c squared equals f times t. What do I want here? I would like to know how fast this thing is moving. Yuck, the velocity is in two different places on the left-hand side. It's up in the numerator, and it's also down in the denominator. If I want to solve for v, Square both sides, I'm going to do this fast. m squared v squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared equals f squared t squared. Next step, multiply through by 1 minus v squared over c squared, both sides to kill the denominator. Next step, get all of these onto the left side of the equation, m squared v squared plus f squared c squared over c squared, coming from here, is equal to just putting f squared t squared from there. Whoops, you just got the v squared. Now do I have to write f squared t squared v squared over c squared. Factor out the v squared on the left, and I get v squared times m squared plus f squared t squared over c squared equals f squared t squared. Ah, uh, you know what, I've got an f squared t squared in two terms. Why don't I divide through by that? That'll leave a 1 there and a 1 here. And put the f squared t squared down here. And how about I multiply through by c squared 2 on both sides. That'll kill it here and put a c squared there. Now what do I have? v squared times mc over ft squared plus 1 equals c squared. I'll divide through by this jump and take the square root. v is equal to c over the square root of 1 plus mc over ft quantity squared. There's the answer. Sorry, there's some algebra in there, but there's the answer. This is the velocity as a function of time for motion at constant force. What does that look like? Well, one thing is clear from the formula. The velocity is always less than c. Isn't that right? Because I got c, and I divide it by a number that's clearly larger than 1. Square root of 1 plus something rather than positive. So it's always less than c. Interesting. No matter how long you pull on something with a constant force, it never gets going faster than the speed of light in relativity. What happens as t goes to infinity? <coughs> Very large times. I'm pulling on this for hours and hours. The t down in the denominator here getting very huge means that this quantity is negligible. So it's just c over 1. Ha! Ah, it goes to c as t goes to infinity. If you want to actually plot this graph, what is the velocity as a function of time? It gets closer and closer to c, but never goes above it, like that. Whereas the classical formula would have gone like that and got bigger than c. So here's classical. What is the formula then? v equals a times t, which is f over m times t. It just gets bigger and bigger without limit. This is the relativistic. 
which has the lovely property that it always stays less than the speed of light, even though you pull it forever with a constant force. Another indication that you can't get something going faster than the speed of light, even if you apply a constant force and keep doing it forever. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.